you stumble upon a big idea and it works really well, you can bring it back year after year. Let's say this is a time of year that Spotify unwrapped is taking the whole world by storm again, right? And this year, each year, they 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 don't just bring it back the same. They added in something unique and fresh every time. So this year, what they started doing was adding in a personalized thank you from some of the artists, right? So where do you start with repurposing content? I would say take your top five pieces of content in the last six months that did really well, okay? Mm -hmm. And so then I, that's almost a challenge, right? Let's say for the month of January, don't create anything new from scratch. Go back and look at entire 2023, what worked really well? What was your highest performing content? And then let's take like the top three or four pieces. And then for each piece, Let's start with, okay, this worked. Who did it work for? Where did it work really well? And then like, what other use can I get out of it? Marketing and sales alignment is not just a word. Like it's so important. Your salespeople talk to customers all day long. They know, you know, you can ask them, what do you always say that helps you close a deal? Or what are the biggest objections you hear? Because then you can put that in your content. As per your partner, your most often used phrase, why did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Any long time husband would say. Hello, welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Jasravi. Subscribe to my channel for conversations at the edge with thought leaders from the branding, marketing, and the business world. Conversations that ignite new ideas, ideas with rough and sharp edges. Hi, Purna. Thrilled to Hi, have you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Puna, I'll request you to introduce yourself as a tweet. What oh, you right. Oh, yeah, some people are calling it Twix now, like <laughs> Twitter, X, anything. So whatever we call it. I would say that um, I am a really, really passionate marketer. Like, follow me for advice around content marketing, women in leadership, and just surviving the bananas world of tech that we all live in. Okay, okay. So, Purna, you use simple analogies and simple examples to explain uh, content. It's, it's really riveting. Uh, and you have used this example of apparel and how content should be enduring like Chanel. So, why do you, uh, you know, make this comparison? Is, is it because of some misconceptions people have? And why do you say it's important to have an enduring set? I think that that analogy, it helps bring it to life, how we are tending to treat our content. Because, you know, since Instagram, since the age of, you know, social, like people are getting into this habit of, I don't want to wear my, be seen wearing the same thing more than once. Or with fast fashion companies coming in, like the whole point of that is to let's, build something with cost and speed in mind rather than any kind of long lasting qualities. But I think having grown up in, in India, like we know, right, we got saris that are passed on from generations, the heirlooms. We are, you know, we used to have the clothes that we'd wear if they get worn out, they would become home clothes. And then home clothes would become like rags or katka, right? So we, I grew up with so much sustainability. So that was the thing that came into mind because I, I, I think my son or somebody just like made this order from, from Sheehan and then he like, oh I was like oh you're gonna wear this like it doesn't look like high quality it's like mom I'm just gonna wear it once and like that is so wasteful considering like how I was you know we we yeah. grew up and so then I almost I'm like wait but are marketers treating their content the same way where you know we just churn it out throw it and then if nothing works just move on to the next one and that's not true like your content is high value investment Treat it more like a Chanel or an heirloom sari that you would, you know, want to wear again and again and bring it out. And so I think sometimes people realize that, oh, yeah, there's actually more I can do with my existing content than just keep looking for the next thing. So that was the that's where the analogy came from. Very interesting. And Indians will so get it. So get it. I love how you said katka. <laughs> Katka, yeah, exactly. We're going to do the katka we wala kapa. Yeah, yeah we, we use it as a swap. See, I mean, we, we, yeah. we it's ingrained. Sustainability is ingrained in us. Okay, so um, Purna, now, see, at some point in time, I request you to put in perspective content and brand campaign as well. Because if content has to be like 
an enduring asset, then what is the idea of campaign? Because that is where, you know, it, it's like one is a book and the other is like a newspaper. You've read it and, you know, you, you've cast it aside. Tomorrow there'll be next. There'll be a new post every time. But a brand campaign, you know, it'll continue for six months and in that much is the time that it will take to even make it. So, uh, you know, uh, at, at, at some point in time, you please address it for us that when you're talking about the big idea, you know, it's the, the, it's the idea that's the enduring asset and maybe not the treatment of the content. Uh, I don't know. You will tell us. This is just, uh, I'm just throwing it there. Now, first of all, explain to us how one idea, one big idea can be, you know, utilized again and again. And why? Uh, because the whole idea is that, you know, I mean, it has to be refreshed. Uh, there should be new ideas. You know, there'll be fatigue otherwise. It's, you have to stop the thumb somehow, you know, uh, be different, be unique. So how is it uh, strategically, how can you do different things yet around one big idea, if you could share that with us? Absolutely. And that's the key thing, right? I'll give you one more clothing analogy is that you should think about your content, like your entire assets of content, almost like how fashion advises you to create a capsule wardrobe. You know how you'll have one really good pair of jeans that will be stylish for decades. You'll have a good like white shirt, never goes out of style, a good jacket, you know, five, six the neutral things that you can rewear year after year. And then just to look fresh and current, you'll buy a couple of trendy items. So maybe I'll get the trendy scarf that everyone's wearing or the trendy belt, something. And that it's okay because I'm not replenishing my entire wardrobe, right? I have stuff that can last. So in that way, you will have some enduring content or some enduring ideas and taglines, right? Nikes just do it. We remember it because they've been using it year after year for decades now. Some things you want to repeat often and often so that it sticks in the head because likely as the marketer, you are really close to your content. You may get fed up of it sooner, but your audience is not paying as much attention to it as you are. So those things can come out. So your branding campaigns, like maybe the fact that maybe you can say like as, you know, as a podcast, like something that's important to me is um, always bringing in like fresh ideas and fresh, you know, perspectives for my audience. Like that idea can stay the same year after year different guests or you could say I really believe in sustainability and then you know once or twice a year you can come out or everything roots back so in that way you do that so anyway that was my question about you know not all your content has to be used all the time right some can be these like one-off social posts or quick idea that's timely like you know you'll do something around some pop culture happening you'll want to jump on that yeah that's fine, but try to keep your consistent, like who you are, what you stand for, how you help people consistent. And then then it comes down to the big ideas. And so where am I, as you said correctly, that ultimately your idea can take many different, you know, avatars. It can come in, it can take different forms. And then how you'll know you've stumbled onto a really big idea as if you can think of 10 different uses for it. You're like, oh, now I have this really good podcast interview. Can I turn it into an article? Can I turn it into like five different uh, blog posts? So you can turn that one idea into like so many different social media posts and you don't have to post them all at one time, but keep bringing it out. Some of your interviews can be quite timeless. So you can say like, oh, you know, jump on something else. Like, I don't know when I interviewed this person that this is what they'd said that relates to this or so on. And you can keep bringing it back up. And so there's so much you can do. So whether it is um, having different people as well within the company talk about it. So whether it is, oh, now I'm going to get my CEO to come and talk about it from their perspective, whether it is, let me get a product person to talk about it from their perspective. There's so many different angles and shifts and tilts that you can do, right? The color Maybe a better analogy is like a color, like red, but there's so many shades of red and there's so many different ways that you can use your idea. Right, right. So like you're saying that the same idea and you can have different perspectives, one way to look at it. And in your book, I, I think you have elaborated which how to look at a big idea so that you're consistent, yet you're bringing in the freshness and you're covering all aspects, like you mentioned all angles. So different people is one of that when you're saying that you can have different perspectives and then talking about it. 
So it, it'll it'll give a fuller picture and it'll keep enriching uh, the idea. Then exactly. You, yes, you have different stages of consumer journey. So could you give some examples and elaborate how with one big idea you can actually do all of it? So in my book, I, I break it down into just different uses, and not every idea can hit all the uses, or some may be better for some uses. So let's take. One idea like recurring, you can take it. If you stumble upon a big idea and it works really well, you can bring it back year after year. Let's say this is the time of year that Spotify unwrapped is taking the whole world by storm again, right? And this year, each year, they 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 don't just bring it back the same. They added in something unique and fresh every time. So this year, what they started doing was adding in a personalized thank you from some of the artists, right? So it feels very personal, like, oh, thank you for listening to my music, blah, blah, blah everyone copies it so that comes back that's easy same thing the Edelman trust barometer report would come out every year every year marketers like jump on it something like that or if it's evergreen content are you refreshing it regularly like Moz has the beginner's guide to SEO that has been dominating the you know anyone looking for beginner's guide to SEO it's been like in the top searches in Google for what like, two decades now. So that's awesome, right? Just shows enduring quality of long lasting content that resonates with people. So that's with time. Then let's look at a stage of the journey. If I was going to ask you, like, just Ravi, how do you explain your podcast to like your five-year-old nephew versus a fellow marketer? You'd come at it in a completely different way, right? Because people's awareness and interest is different. So if we're talking about AI, for example, your AI solution, not everyone is as familiar with it or AI as you are. So maybe you want to think about somebody who has a no idea if they have a problem. So I love this framework that comes from Eugene Schwartz in his book called Breakthrough Advertising from 1966. And like, it's such a good framework. We can take it for marketing too. So let's say it starts off with completely unaware. People don't know that they can get better. So I'm like, hey, just Ravi, did you know there was this awesome tool that if I start talking to you about this awesome AI podcasting tool, you'd be like, wait, I'm doing fine. Like, I don't need it. But then if we were like, hey, here's why podcasters need to pay attention to this brand new AI tool. You'd be like, huh, let me see. That applies to me. Or the next level is maybe they know they have a problem, but they don't know there's a solution. Maybe you could be... And I'm, Hopefully it's okay to use you as an example, but yeah. anyone. So maybe it's a company that's like, oh, you know, I get AI is coming and I, I don't know what to do. Like I'm spending hours like editing my content after what do I do? And then you just don't know the solution exists. So you're like, oh, here's a tool that saves, you know, podcasters tons of hours in editing. And you're like, ah, now I'm interested. Or then maybe you know that there's, you know, you have a problem, you know what the solution is. And then you are saying that, well, who who do I choose? So then you want to try to, you know, people aren't ready to hit, be hit over the head with a salesy message at this point. Maybe it's thought leadership from the AI tools, CEO or product suite to be like, here's how I use it to make life better. And like Microsoft, who I used to work for before, they have this awesome blog where they talk about it's like a workday blog is what it's called. And they had this interview where here's all the product managers who built the AI products and here's how they use it to get more creativity and efficiency. Genius. It's like human interest. But it's the same idea, right? You're still talking about all the awesome ways that the AI is helpful. And then it keeps going down into if you're most aware, what do you do? Then you want your social proof, things like case studies and all that. So you, when you're ready to buy. So if you really break it down, you want to meet your audience where they're at, right? If I kept coming to you and be like, look at this case study, look at this AI tool, it does all of this. And you're like, I don't even, I don't, I don't think I have a problem. Like I'm not ready to listen to it. Then it's, and that's the issue that's happening, especially now in the time. Marketers still go out there and be like, take a free demo, take a free demo. And like people don't have budget right now to even buy what you're demoing. So why would they want to take a free demo, right? So in that case, just focus on your audience, get where they're at, get what they need to know at every stage of the awareness slash interest journey, and then present it with that. Right. If you watch an Apple, you know, every year Apple comes up with their product announcement, right? It's always the same. It's the CEO comes out with big inspirational storytelling here's what we've launched like high level inspirational 
connect with the audience. Then they'll bring out different product people to come in and talk about a feature or a benefit in more detail. Then, you know, they'll have different reporters and, you know, experts, influencers in the audience will talk about it. And we as consumers, what do we do? We consume all of it. We want to hear what the CEO said, what the product said, what, you know, our peers say, what experts, like journalists say. We'll read it all. And each one has a different angle. So that's what you can also do is it doesn't always have to come from your brand. It can come from different voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People who do content and... uh and actually creating content, I mean, they, they, they can really appreciate how valuable this advice is because they know they have to churn out content again and again. Sticking to some things or sticking to some, a big idea and yet going on doing something that is adding on to, you know, some, some anchors. Now, there, there's, a, there's a, a beautiful uh, example that you've taken and I'm saying because right now one of my brands is in that category, so it's very relevant for me. <laughs> coming to that fancy car example that you've taken somewhere. Uh, but so if I have a fancy car, now I'm just taking that example and uh, I'm doing content. So brand campaign is separate. I'm doing content because I am to appeal to um, Gen Z millennials mostly. Now I should be understanding the cohorts. I should be understanding the people that I have to reach to. Uh, whether they're going to, because there is a delayed time as well, with, uh, you know, between coming to know about it and then buying. So, uh, you know, there, there is a there is a diverse audience I have to talk to. Yes, and there is a consumer journey. So, you're saying for each cohort, you have to understand where they are in terms of your brand, in terms of the barrier that they might have, in terms of um, the stage of awareness that they are at and then engage them through content while you know that one big idea that that is about your brand uh, or that you've identified as the task for content you keep building so if you if you take this example uh, i want you to talk about how to arrive at the goals for content you know that whole principle of Content comes first or business goal comes first. How would you go about um, this and then the stages of it? How do you link everything here? I'm going to break this down into two parts. So the first is, where do you start with repurposing content? I would say, take your top five pieces of content in the last six months that did really well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then... I, that's almost a challenge. Right? Let's say for the month of January, don't create anything new from scratch. Go back and look at entire 2023. What worked really well? What was your highest performing content? And then let's take like the top three or four pieces. And then for each piece, let's start with, okay, this worked. Who did it work for? Where did it work really well? And then like, what other use can I get out of it? And then based on that, how to ideate which goals or where to get out from it all comes down to this concept that I call backward design. Well, actually, it's a concept that comes from the world of instructional design, where I spent many years working in uh, learning and development. And so I, I realized, I've, I've used that concept in marketing again, where you know how as marketers, typically our first thing is, okay, what's the content I need to create? Then where will I publish it? And then how will I measure it? Right? It happens in this order. Like, what do I need to say? Or what did the audience need to hear? Where will I publish it? Then how will I measure it? But that usually is not going to give you the right aspect. So it's going to make it very challenging to connect it back to business goals. So when I say it, start backwards, like flip the approach, start with what your business goals are. So as you said, let's say like the fancy car company. So let's say your, your car company is coming up with a brand new model of the car, all electric, all, you know, whatever, James Bond features, let's say. And so now you're going to think that what's my goal? My goal, if I was the company, is to get advanced, like whatever, sales of the car. So that's great. Selling more cars is a business goal. So then I'll go to the next level. Like I'm a marketer, like ultimately I'm creating content. Like that is not really, is it going to do the full sales? So what's the audience behavior change that I can drive? And for me, I would say like one good change that we can get people excited about is to come and take a test drive or just configure the car on their phone, right? Either one. And that is going to just increase the odds of them 
coming to the showroom, talking to a salesperson, and then the salesperson will close the sale. Mm -hmm. So then if I have to think about now, I need content that's going to get people excited to come to the showroom. Mm -hmm. So who are the audiences that I'm going to target? Like who is most likely to want to buy a car like this? Who has the money? Who has shown interest previously? And then what do they like? What type of content do they resonate with? Where do they hang out? Where do they hang out? And so then you start thinking about what should my content say? So then if you can already look at any of those five examples that you've highlighted, be, you know, would any of these work? Like, is there a grain of this idea here? And then I can just tweak it a little bit more. And then I'll make sure that my call to action is always configure it on the app or come take a free show test drive or something. And then I know or I stack the odds in my favor that for sure, like I'm leading it towards the right outcome for the company. Because that way you are able to align content goals and business goals. Right, right. Absolutely. So this this thing that you've nuanced is that the, the behavior that we want, that will decide. Uh, so for that sale to happen, what is the behavior content has to induce is what I will focus on. Now, in this case, what will be a big idea? What will be a high impact uh, asset, if you had to call it? Um, so, so the car brand is uh, has a campaign of born born French now in India. So, and it's an electric vehicle. So, of course, there's an evolved mindset uh, that we're talking about now. How how will they go about finding the uh, big idea will it be something around the fact uh, that that um, the test drive has to happen will it be something how, how will you identify so your question is how do i know even what to create what is with the big that? idea what is, with that what is the big that? idea for it and that will yes. start by understanding your audience Hmm. Right, something that we know about the Indian audience in particular is that you know, car is a tend to like a status symbol, right? That's what yes. we want. Think about why the Tata Nano marketing didn't, didn't work because it was like the yes. cheapest car in the market, right. and we're like, hey, nobody wants to be known as driving like the cheapest car in the market, right? That was a big placement, like idea placement issue because yes. of the, and the audience intention, yes. So it was a brilliant idea. It was an amazing car. It was actually what India could have benefited from. But yeah. just the marketing did not understand the audience. So they didn't land it correctly. Yes. Uh, I, think, I mean, that was just one part of the issue. I know it's more complex than that. And no, but that I, was a big part. That was a big part. Yes. That was a big part. So then I'm trying to think about, okay, so a, let's, you were giving the example, like it's a French brand, right? So maybe like what is... Um, unique and important about the French brand itself. They should have already have identified it. Yes. And yes. then you're going to find like what's in the unique Indian market. Like who are you trying to market it to, right? Cars also have different audiences. Are you trying to market it as a family car? Then you maybe you want to talk about safety. If you want to target it as like the sexy car, then, you know, maybe you're going to talk about all of just the speed, like zero to 100, right? People have different reasons for wanting to buy a car. And like in some yeah. cases, can be just even the the sound that a door car door makes while closing yeah. um, people engineer that by the way like some of it is not even just a real sound like it's a psychoacoustic so yeah. different things get people to relate so you're like all right so who's my audience in india is it the corporate professionals like this you know the new yeah, young yeah. Okay. Hmm. exactly so like so whoever that is what it is so then what's important to them you hmm. will have done your whole audience research and i have a whole chapter in my book that dedicated just how to do it more effectively read reviews, read what these people are saying, like look at your competitor brands, like maybe you're yeah, competing with that segment, yeah. or something like that, or Citron, right? And maybe you're going to go in and look at, you know, let's look at a German car as well, because that's another competitor. Like maybe you're yeah. going to look at the BMWs, um, of course. Yeah. Like, what else are you going to look at? So let's say Italian cars, yeah. right, you're going to look at Suzuki, yeah. you know, surveys, like why do people buy them? What is that? How do they position it? And mm -hmm. then you want to find a way to position yourself that's different in a way, right? What's unique about the car? You want to try to connect what's unique about you and your value to what your really audience wants and find that overlap, right? Think of a Venn diagram, like this is what my audience wants, this is what what's important. What brand cares about, what audience cares about. Exactly. And then if you take oh, that overlap yeah. area, like that's where you start. And so there's a whole chapter, like it's hard for me to summarize it in like two minutes yeah. or less yes. an answer, but you must, your audience research is non-negotiable. Like even if you're like, oh, but I know, you don't know because you you're... Know. 
you yeah, know, yeah, say, like yeah. do it again, do yeah, it fresh, like more. talk to yes. Exactly, talk to existing customers, understand the local market, understand how to position it, how to localize it. Um, you know, what are the biggest motivating factors that the audience might have here, who you're trying to reach? And it can vary and then um, put all those together. And then you'll have exactly what to say, how to say it, where do they hang out? Do they, you know, do they tend to be on a particular channel or platform? Is it email? Is it through, do they tend to listen to podcasts while driving? Who knows? Or how do you get them to want to test out the new car? And so the whole content should appeal to them. And at the, you know, your call to action, because every content piece needs to have a call to action. Doesn't have to be salesy. Even it could be like, you know, check out, uh, read more about this, whatever fancy hydrogen powered. And I don't know, I'm just making up words, right? I'm, I I don't know cars well, as you probably tell. So like, just check out this new hydrogen powered engine that we have and, learn more about that and that just could be the next step right everything is not going to want to always say come take a test drive but give them an option like seed it in their head like you know configure it on the app and then on the app can be like come take a test drive in person we'd love to see you know see how we go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in three seconds or something yeah so so this on this overlap purna the brand cares about and what this thing, it could actually be a space as well, right? It's, it could be a larger space that would require some more, some multiple themes to cover to, to be able to address that. Like so For sure. But the at the end of it, those all themes are high, high impact, you know, assets. What I want to know is that when we say a big, big impact, big, uh, you know, the asset, it need not be one idea. It is in that space of what uh, is going to make your product relevant to your teaching. Exactly. It's never good. It can be one idea in like different, different formats. And right, maybe I can talk about, uh, let's say there's like a TV show. Uh, what's that British TV show about? Like, so what's a top fast car or something? Whatever. I, I forget the name. But, okay. you know, there's a show that people go in and drive and do like all of this good thing. Um One idea can either come at it in different ways, but the root is one idea where, you know, I want to showcase the speed of the car and the safety. And so like speed without compromising on safety or something like that. So what could it be? It could be, you know, look at all of these like dummy test drive accidents and see how the dummy has had no, uh, you know, the crash test dummy that they use, right? It has had no negative effects. So here's all the times and it's used that. Or yeah. you could have another one where you focus more on the speed and then just say, like, this is the material. Then you could have something that talks about this unique metal blend in the car that makes it. But again, I am just guessing and speculating because I haven't done enough due diligence into the audience. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Once you learn about the audience, when you learn about, you know, what makes them make the decision about buying a car, what do they favor a lot? Those your ideas will write themselves when you understand your audience. So don't even go looking at other marketing experts to come up like, what's a good idea? Because we're all just guessing and we're not buying, are we? So the people whose money you're looking for, you should see what's going to appeal to them. What do they resonate with? It can be multiple ideas or it could be one idea that can take so many different forms. Like it can be, as you said, the same idea, but coming at it from somebody who doesn't know anything about cars to somebody who's like a super car like connoisseur. And how do I get them excited versus somebody who's maybe got into a lot of money and like has the means, but maybe maybe somebody like me who has no idea about cars, right? I'll just, yeah. I'm like, yeah. my husband will try to explain to me and I'm like, listen, I don't care. Like, does it get me to point A to point B? Like, I'm not a, I'm just happy to sit in the car. Does it run? Is it reliable? Safe? I'm happy. Whereas my husband will think very differently about the car. Is there one idea that appeals to both? And maybe not. You don't have to force it. But if you have this big high value initiative, like what am I going to do about the launch? How am I going to sort of get more grassroots effort? Maybe if I know that my audience cares about sustainability, then I can come in and I can do a sort of grassroots like sustainability campaign where I'm like let's clean up the beach in this area sponsored by us like we'll come in and do that right that's just another way to build top of mind awareness it's still on the idea of sustainability because then you can talk about how because it's electric or it saves all this petrol it is also sustainable so you think about these different offshoots once you know what your audience cares about yeah um why does that not get the due diligence why um 
So what are the tools that you should use to uh, get to an understanding just from a digital perspective of your audience in terms of their behavior, in terms of the thoughts? There is secondary research, there is digital uh, data, and there is primary research. And there's so much you can do to get, your, get to an understanding of PTG. How can analytics help uh, in understanding the TG and in being efficient in terms of posting? So analytics is great, and that's definitely a piece of the puzzle, but it's also and it's just data, and most analytics tools give you example data. It's not a 100 even So that's one thing, but what you're missing, well, most why most people don't do it or why more people don't do it is because it takes work and people are like, oh no, we can't afford to take two weeks to just like research the customer. We need to just go out there and put content out there and see what works, which is you're just wasting time. You're keeping yourself stuck on the treadmill. It's worth the investment. If you took even one week and identify, like, let me talk to 10 people who are just like our target audience who we're trying to reach. You know, you'd only have to talk to eight or 10 people. If you talk to more of them, you, you're just going to hear a very like similar theme. So talk to like, people who would be your ideal customer, people who bought from you before, people you're trying to win over and be like, what would motivate you? Like, what do you look for? What are your, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions that I have written out in, in that chapter in the book. So one is actually talk with customers, existing customers, people who'd likely buy another card. Talk to people who maybe fit the profile, who maybe haven't bought with you before. What what would they say? What's their perception of the brand? Um, go ahead and talk to people who used to be a customer of your brand, but then switched. Because, you know, why did they switch? Because that sometimes that will, you know, even if you talk to three or four people who used to be your customer, or maybe they went through the funnel, but decided not to buy, right? Maybe they came down all the way to talk to Citroen, but in the end, they were like, sorry, I'm going with Tesla. You know, then you're like, why did you choose Tesla over us? Then you will get those gaps into customers' perceptions about your brand, right? You know it's awesome because you work there. You're also getting like paid <laughs> to think you're awesome, right? You're much more vested in it. But no one else cares as much about mm-hmm. it as you do. Mm-hmm. So then for them, like, why are they choosing Tesla slash another brand? Uh, the other thing you want to do is read reviews, look online, see what the other people are talking. Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do, and it is. I can, you know, I will tell you, like, I I will swear that you will never regret that time because everything that you build off of that is going to be based on that understanding, and then you'll resonate with that target audience because, you know, everybody's not your target audience. You're the ideal type of customer is actually quite few where it's a brand. Usually every company has like this top 20%, like the upper stratum of -hmm. customers where if like, oh, if I just had like 20 more like these people, we'd be so good, that type. So that would be great. And then, you know, maybe you want to get into a B2B case. So maybe you're Mm -hmm. trying to go to another brand and say that, you know, why don't you buy all your employees this car and so on. So what would they need? So identify your personas. I don't talk to people who fit those personas, see what it looks like. And by the way, persona, I don't just mean like the, you know, marketing molly or something like that, because that's just nonsense. That's just people yeah. you making it up. I mean, actually go down as to who are the types of people who buy, like your sales team will have this info. Yeah. You know, talk yeah. to your sales teams as well. Marketing and sales alignment is not just a word like it's so important your salespeople talk to customers all day long they know you know you can ask them what do you always say that helps you close a deal or what are the biggest objections you hear because then you can put that in your content so yeah. do those yeah. steps and you'll never regret it the objections you mentioned objections there are four objections that you uh, typically mention i request you to come to that also and uh, I also share something and I want to know your views. I-, I was doing another podcast with a content expert and she talked about uh, how she's made a content fuel format, Melanie Diesel. And on, on X-axis is uh, what things, you know, like what you will talk about. And on Y-axis is the format, how. So... I was just wondering that, like you said, the five posts that have worked very well for repurposing, if we figure out what is the message that is working, as resonating, one can look at the how or, or different kinds of formats that are possible and can use that to milk it. Does that make sense? 
I'm sure I'm not I know Melanie and I think she's amazing but I haven't <laughs> read her book but um I have not I'm not familiar with the concept but just from the little that you you know just from a knowing Melanie and how amazing she is and and from your description I'm sure it would be amazing so but I'm just gonna say I'm gonna caveat with I'm not super in depth with that but yeah that's super tactical so you can think about them like oh, can I put it in a different format, which is just another way of repurposing it, right? And it's much more inclusive to offer your content in different ones too. But yeah, the but before you can even get to that point of tactical, and that's the whole issue, because yes. so many of us as marketers, our brains is much more to like, you know, this is like waste of time. Let me just go into the tactics and do that. But every, your strategy will fail if you, even if you do the best tactics, even if your execution is the best in the world, if your strategy is wrong, you're just not going to get the results that you're looking for. Yes, yes, and yes. so that's why I'm saying invest the time up front into the audience, their challenges, their struggles, their objections. And yeah, most objections can boil down to four things. Like one's either they don't see the value mm -hmm. to you, uh, of you in their life. You would explain that. Mm -hmm. Two, they don't see it as a priority. You've got to make them see that this is worth your time and it's worth your time now. And here's all the gains. The third one is maybe they're just not the right person with the right level of influence. So you could be talking to them all the time, but they're, you know, researching for the bigger decision maker. Mm. They don't, you know, you want to see how you can reach the decision maker as well as the influencers of the decision. And then uh, the fourth one will just be like, they don't, they are not questioning you. They don't know who you are or their perception could be wrong. They may be like, I've never heard of this brand or this person or this company. Like, can I trust them? Right. That a lot of startups can sometimes worry about that because they are brand new. They'll come in and be like, I can do all of these things. And they're like, well, who are you? We've not, you know, because sometimes you want to get that. So you want to try to see, are you somehow in different pieces of content are you able to overcome these four sort of root objections yeah. and that can also be really helpful or you can see which one is you know impacting your brand the most yeah or uh, like you talk about how your existing customer is also a wealth of uh, knowledge because mm -hmm. you know most of the times uh, marketers and, and even you know brand strategists and specialists are trying to get to this new new buy let the sale happen but the person you converted uh, with a lot of effort, you know, what is the information they can give? How can they help uh, marketers? If you could just quickly uh, talk to us about that. So really, I think it's understanding the information that they can get is that what was what motivated the desire or what would get them to wake up the desire in them to purchase. That would be one, um, you know, the biggest thing you can think about is like what's going to happen to their life like after you buy it. Well, don't, you know, what are they hoping for the outcome to be? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to buy a certain tool, I, I'm hoping that it'll save me time and make me more efficient so I can go back and, you know, work less hours in the day. So that's your hook. Like you want to work less hours in the day, do that, right? They're not buying the tool because it will edit like 10 times faster. They're buying it because they want to work less hours and have more free time. So focus on what's going to happen like after they've got your solutions. But again, it's benefits over features, which is a long time marketing effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've talked about community. You're talking about how advocacy can happen. And so this is a very important segment. Uh, uh, get hold of that uh, marketers and, and don't, don't forget them because they'll help you convert more people. Okay. <laughs> If you took time to answer or if you elaborated, this will come at you. Are you prepared? Oh, as prepared as I'll ever be. Let's go for it. I'm terrified. What is best advice? Um, work hard and don't worry about anything else. So, yeah. You should have said it in Hindi. Okay. Alternate profession yeah. could have been? I would have been a travel journalist because I love traveling. What would you do on Mars for fun? Read books. If I've survived, yeah. <laughs> you will. As per your partner, your most often used phrase. Why did you do this? <laughs> As any long time husband would say. <laughs> one thing no one knows about you. I think that I'm actually secretly an introvert, but I just I like people, but I need to go back and recharge. 
It's solitude. I get you. Okay. A book you'd like to gift to all your friends, not your own. No, my own book. I would probably say The Spirit of Kaizen because I really like the concept of that business book where it was like small changes will end up having much bigger results yeah. and they're more long lasting, consistent. Yeah, atomic everything. Okay. What's something new happening in your life right now? Nothing exciting, unfortunately. I'm hoping for something new and exciting to come in. She's coming to India, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm, going, I'm going home, which is good. Okay. What's your favorite childhood memory? Um, just playing with all my cousins and running around, like which I don't think, like sadly, any further generation, like my son's generation, doesn't do that. Just like running around the building, playing, yeah. very much unsupervised. Which now, if I think about it, yeah. If you were to devote the rest of your life to philanthropy, what would you choose? I would save animals. Like that is my dream. Like the minute I win the lottery, I've it all planned out. I'm gonna buy this big farm and I'm gonna save like all the dogs that I can and hire all the staff to look after them. So all the little good boys and good girls have a very happy, safe life. Online address, your email and something about your book, High Impact Content Marketing. All of the links will be there in the channel, uh, in the notes below. So hit me up. So hit me up anytime on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter. I'm most active. There's the best place to message me as well. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you can find high impact content marketing in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local friendly bookstore near you. So I hope you read it. If you find it valuable, hit me up on LinkedIn and tell me. I would love to hear more. <laughs>